Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Claude Hendrickson here, and I've got Tom. You can introduce yourself. And I'm Tom, I'm the Chief Executive of the National Community Land Trust Network. Okay, right. What we're going to do here then, since there's nobody going to be introducing us, because I thought it was going to be done different, I'm going to share my screen now, and we'll, we're going to um, do a setting the scene video. I'm going to show you a six minute video. And then after that, I will do my introduction and go through my um, sh sheets. So, um, where is it now? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Right, I've lost you, Tom. Okay, sharing screen. My name's Randolph, Randolph Mon. It's just been a house a month. Looking behind, there's still a fair bit for us to do. It's just that we're worried about getting the shells up before the winter. I don't know. I don't think we'll still get them up for October, end of October. Yeah, I reckon so. Some of us are building our own houses. Most of us live in substandard housing or homes that are not our own. We've been trying to get the outside work done by December. The project was a vision of one local man, Claude Hendrickson. It was all cobbled streets. It was atrocious. Um, and, and, and this and this is what really drives me. In the mid eighties, we had streets and streets of houses blocked up, empty, empty, hard to um, doing nothing. Whilst people were living three to a bedroom, four to a bedroom. Um, and again, these are things that inspired us to um, get up and do the self build. Um, you're talking in, in maybe twenty houses. You're talking at least. Eight, nine of them. Not like this, and turn the camera. You know, you talk about eight, nine of them in disrepair like this. This is this was the pendulum that you made every single street within Chapter Town. Last year, winter, this started happening. This is my flat, a typical example of the housing around the area. And I can't live here anymore. It's not as bad now, but wait till the winter sets in again. Obviously, I'm going to drop down. <laughs> my name is uh, Michael Bennett. Yeah. One of the bricklayers for Frontline Sales Bill. Today, Saturday, what we've decided to come in today and actually finish the gable end. So we already prepared for Monday morning. To me, frontline is my life. We're doing a good thing for the community, not just in building houses, but to teach the young generation out there if they want something in life, they can actually get that with hard work. This is a Upstairs, all the stunning, all the door liners are in position. This um, is with the kit, the bathroom. And a lot of people are coming this as a, it's a bit small, but I mean, as far as we're concerned, it's uh, is, you know, 
and I'm like, I've got all my keys up here, and that and I'm like, I can get out of bed, I think I've got a seat downstairs now. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind. It's my, my house. I built it. The weather's not been too kind to us, but we still managed to just keep up. I reckon I'm still doing it. And remember, guys. The other day it was raining, and I went to it raining, raining cats and dogs. And this guy was in the gutter. I said, Mackie, tea time. And I said, Shorty, after the rain, let's get this trench dug. Well, that's the kind of action I'd like to hear. Comic Relief has given us the money to pay for Graham Gill. He's our site supervisor. At this moment in time, we've been on site um, six months. We put the equivalent of 10 houses, which, realistically speaking, for a self build, it works better than any self build that's ever done before it. No other self build has managed to do it as quick as this. Or to the standard that this one's been done either. Um, this is the largest group that I know of within Chapter Town region, 12 men working together. And I think the experience that we gain from this will help them to stay together, to form a cooperative, and tender for work within the community. Some of the people that are out of work right now, in a couple of years, we could be employing them ourselves and helping to solve the housing problem that we have in our community. We're not saying self can solve it, or we're not saying frontline can solve the whole of it, but we're saying frontline is definitely taking a step in the right direction. The youths out there, they don't really have much really to look forward to, because I never. Now it's our turn to show our generation. What they can really do if they put their mind to it. Okay, thank you for that. I am going to share my screen again. I just need to um, get this up, get this there, get this up, get this up, share. There you go. Can you see that? Can everybody see that? Can you see that, Tom? Because I can't see anybody. Yep. Okay. Yep. You, you can see that, Tom. Yeah, I can. Yeah, oh, go for it. Oh, one minute, one minute, one minute. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, Sorry, sorry about this. I have to stop sharing. I have to. One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. And it was a very hard start. I am trying to find out this is where the that I went to five it's years old. Gone. The names we would be. Right, there we go. There we go. Can you still see that, Tom? Can you see that, Tom? No, not now. Okay. I'm just Yeah, there we go. Okay. Still with you. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Whenever you take a video off of YouTube, um, it, it seems to just go to the next one. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks to Runny Mead for inviting me along with, and Tom for the invitation to come with Tom from um, Community Land Trust. My name's Claude Hendrickson. Um, I'm based in Chapel Town in Leeds. Um, and to this afternoon, we're here to talk about how we can stimulate more black 
led housing projects in the UK, not just in the North, but in the UK. Um, I am an equality, diversity, and inclusion associate to Leeds Community Homes, which was funded under the Cohesive Communities by Tom's organization, the National Community Land Trust Network. So thanks to Tom for that. Um, a little bit about me, um, because I think it's, it is important listening to some of the speakers this morning, that people understand some of the journeys that we have to take as black people to kind of prove ourselves um, as, we, as we move through the system. Um, so I've been active in the Chapel Town community over 30 years. Um, I was involved in the first race riots of 1975 as a 15 year old young child. Um, for the Londoners, Darkus Howe was my mentor. Um, I met Darkus Howe in 1975 as a young 15 year old um, when we had our riots. In that 30 years I have done, like you've just seen, I initiated the Frontline Self-Build Project, which was a group of unemployed black men to build their own houses, um, gain employment, a sense of respect, um, get respect from their peers. I was also, I've also been the co-founder and director of the Chapel Town Young People's Club, which was giving the young people of Chapel Town a voice to shape the future services delivered to them. I was also involved in the first internet cafe opening in Leeds, um, in the Chapel Town area, which was back in 2000, which was our millennium project, again, with the Chapel Town Young People's Club. Um, I'm a black men's health champion. Um, I go out um, promoting men's health, trying to raise the issue with men and health. Um, I have done research across three cities in um, Yorkshire, Leeds, Bradford and Huddersfield, looking at education, training and employment, health and well-being and the inequalities around them. Um, I've also been involved with an organisation that I know is speaking tomorrow called BTEG um, as one of their black male role models and I was trying to set up a Yorkshire role model project and I'm still something at dear to my heart which goes into school speaking to young boys. Over the past 30 years I've worked face to face with individuals from all walks of life and backgrounds with diverse abilities um, have produced consistent outcomes from my work and for my clients. I think that's important because at the end of the day sometimes some of the things we as we do within our community. And when you live and work in your community, it's different to being parachuted into that community. So the, the um, history of what has happened stays within that community. And sometimes when we have people parachute into our communities, the history doesn't remain. So I'm here to kind of talk of the history of Chapel Town. My journey with community-led housing, the first part, and I'm watching the time, Tom, I'm not gonna cut into your time. Um, Frontline was a project that was set up, number one, because um, back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was said that black men were, did not want to work, we were unemployable, they wanted to do negative things. So I wanted to prove that a group of black men working together could achieve something and not just building houses but actually building a better future for themselves and setting an example for young men and other members of the community coming up um, so we set out to build these houses and believe you me it was not an easy task from we st started out to actually delivering it was six years of jumping over hurdles um, you know, everybody's telling us, every organization telling us that we could not do it, that they had no evidence, a group of black men working together could achieve anything. So 25 years on, the house is there, you can see in the bottom picture, 25 years on, the houses are still there, still pristine, 92,000 bricks, 52,000 blocks, 
12 semi-detached houses, two bedroomed houses. We even renamed the street Frontline Close. And that name came about because the guys were off of the front line. Um, I went on and um, I, firstly, I'll say I was inspired by another black project which happened in St. Paul's in Bristol um, in the early 80s. A group of men down there built a block of 12 flats. So that was my, that was my inspiration. Um, I then became a member of the Community Self Build Agency, which has completed something like 178 self build projects across the UK, some 100 and 1200 units. Um, and out of that 778 um, projects, maybe, maybe 3% to 5% of the projects were projects led by black people. And within the community led housing sector, you will find in Liverpool, the, it, his, history will teach you that uh, there was a black project in Liverpool. There's been black projects many years ago in Birmingham. There's been black projects in London. There's been black projects obviously in Leeds, but we still only make up less than 5% of the projects that have happened nationally. And Tom will give you some more stats, I hope, about community, um, the Community Land Trust and the number of Black-led organizations they have under their umbrella. In 2010, I met an interesting man, um, Major Ken Hames, who's an ex-SAS officer. And what we found out was that um, 60 to 70 percent of all homeless men living on the street were actually ex-veterans, ex-military people. So we set about running a number of projects in Bristol um, for veterans, a really good charity. We must have done at least 12, 13 projects in Bristol. Um, and Bristol for me is the home of community self-build. Um, in 2012, to move on, um, I became the Northern Director of the um, Community Self-Build Agency in a voluntary capacity which gave me the, 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 the license to go forward and promote self-build in the north of the UK, because historically, I would say something like 60 to 70% of self-build was being done in the south of the UK, not as much in the north, even though I do know there are projects in the north, but nowhere near as many as down in, uh, in and around London um, and, and down in that region. Um, in 2015, I was commissioned by Leeds City Council to produce a 10-year strategy into self-build and community-led housing, um, which I produced. Um, it's sitting on their shelves now. And what we wanted to look into was wanting to, know, wanting to prove that um, the community-led housing could contribute to the crisis that we have in the housing sector. We can't solve it, but we can contribute. Um, so I did that report, whistle stop. In Leeds, after Frontline set up, and, and this is kind of important for me, Frontline was set up in 1988. But since then, in 1989, we had a project set up called Latch, led by two white guys that came from Oxford University and Cambridge and came to live in Leeds. They set up Latch. Another white group set up Canopy. Uh, another white group set up Gypsum. Another white group set up Lilac. Um, Chaco is the latest project that is happening in Leeds, which was set up by another white group, but they have elected a black chair. The reason I've shown you this, and this is just Leeds, this is not the whole sector, this is Leeds. Now in Leeds, I tried to work with every one of these organizations. They all turned me away. Uh, even though Frontline had kick-started the community-led sector in Leeds, none of the white organizations wanted to work with me. Um, which was very demoralizing. 
Um, but it didn't stop me. I went on, like I showed you before, I went on and did stuff with young people. So I've been in and around the community-led sector for 25 years. And, um, and, and I will say that, and, and you know, Tom knows I'm honest about this. Um, it is pre very predominantly white-led for white people. That doesn't mean there haven't been small numbers of projects Black for black people or black people have not been involved in projects, but it must be less than 5% of the overall projects that have happened nationally. Tom may serve to differ from me. Um, in 2019, I came back to the community led sector um, in Leeds. I joined um, and partnered, partnered up with Leeds Community Homes, originally as their BAME, and LGBT advisor, um, which has now become the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Associate. In January 2020, I became the first black male credited community-led advisor in the UK. So they created a, an accreditation. I went on the accreditation funded by um, a bit of money from um, National Community Land Trust and Leeds Community Homes, became the first black male. Um, my role is to get more black and ethnic minority groups involved in the community-led sector. And that is my intention. And um, with, to that, we, uh, these were the, the main ethoses of, of, of uh, me getting involved. The most important goal was to encourage more minority groups to become involved in the sector, not only just being members of projects, but actually leading that project, just the same way I did with Frontline. Um, and, and this is not just about building new homes, there's a, a massive number of houses out there to be re refurbished. I'm not only interested in just creating homes, but creating employment and enterprise. Because when you build homes, you need, to, you need to maintain them. So there's opportunities for our young people to learn trades in construction. I think construction is probably one of the biggest institutions where color a lot of the time doesn't matter. If you're a good tradesman, you will get work. And um, I think, you know, we need to be pushing more of our young people because everybody can't be an academic. Everybody can't work in a call center. And I would put this out to you. How often have you looked for a plumber, a, a joiner, a painter and decorator, you know, a landscape gardener? You know, they're hard to find. So that industry needs more. Um, to develop a strategy, one of the things that's come out of my work is looking at homelessness and looking at how we can get more homeless people involved in the community-led sector. Also looking at new migrated, migrating and undocumented and documented people in, in the system to see how we can get them involved in the sector. This by, um, right now I'm working with Leeds uh, Migration Partnership in Leeds. I'm also working with RETAS, which is a, 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 an organization. I'm having to move quick because my time's running out. Okay. Um, what has come out of my work with the community-led sector in in the last year is me and a, a brother called Henry Baptiste from Pathways Solutions in Nottingham, whom we met up on, on the accreditation and training. We're um, heading up some research into black people and community-led sector. Um, oops. Research objectives, I'm gonna have to rush this because I, I know our time's short because we started late to ex examine structural barriers for minority-led organizations getting involved in the sector, review organizational approaches in, to enable communities to get more involved. This will explore existing policies as well as proposed changing, changes in policy and the strategy resulting from increased urgency, especially after what's happened with COVID, I think COVID has served as a, 
as a slow, it's slow motion in time for people to really look at the inequalities that have been happening in the system and Black Lives Matters only came along to us, um, build on them. As to survey government offices, local authorities, intermediary funders, organizations in the community-led sector, to review the take-up of community-led housing models by Black and ethnic minority communities. If, if they're not taking them up, why are they not taking them up? Um, to identify barriers and opportunities for transformation. I think to the community-led sector, there is a lot of opportunities if they can engage and empower Black communities. I think that can be another string to the bow of the community-led sector. Um, to deliver a report on how the sector operates, so to produce evidence and give recommendations on how it can be changed. And I don't want this to be another report, just like the dis Barrett's report, I mean, real tangible changes to the sector. To highlight good practices um, and develop case studies because um, the community-led housing sector does have some good practices and some good examples and how can we case study them and take them forward. To produce a series of, rec of recommendations and an action plan. To scope future funding for the sector, to be involved in getting more people to do community-led housing projects and become community land trusts. Also to help develop an um, equality, diversity and training kit for the center, for, sorry, for the sector, no matter whether you're in a rural part of, of the country or you're in an urban part, all organizations should have an EDI um, policy. Um, the nine stages, and I'm, I'm flashing through this scoping, policy and strategy review, review practical survey, um, gap and SWOT analysis, recommendations and consultation, action planning, um, research report and action planning, and follow up with hopefully we can get the funding. What I will say about this is we are looking, um, as, we, as we speak, we are looking to raise funding for this research, um, I would say, and I will say that um, Tom and his team have put up some finance, um, Power to Change has put up a little bit of finance for this research, but we are looking for funding and funding bodies to support this work. So if, if there's any of, our, the, any of you out there that are funders, um, I would love to get in touch with you and see how you can support this work. Thank you for that. I will take questions at the end because I want to hand you over to Tom now, who's been sat there quite neatly and, and, and um, um, not saying anything. Tom, your turn. Can't hear you, Tom. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Gord. Um, so I noticed already we've had a comment from Greg in the in the chat about uh, taking over community building. So Gil's talked a lot about housing. I'm going to talk a bit about housing as well. And also other things that community land trusts can do, like community buildings. And I guess one of the reasons we've focused a bit on housing is, I was talking to Gil about this yesterday, that everybody lives in a home. And if there's a kind of asset that the community can own that would have the biggest and most fundamental impact on people in this country, it's housing and um, so it's a good kind of interesting place to start but a lot of the principles we're talking about you could apply to other sorts of buildings other kinds of assets as well so the community land trust network we're a charity we were set up about 10 years ago um, and we're but also a membership body for community land trusts there up and down the country and our focus is on really trying to create the conditions for this to be much more accessible and not quite so difficult so communities all over the country, every community can take advantage of this approach to take control and ownership of assets like housing um, so they can make themselves more, more of a sustainable community and address some of the issues that they face. Um, I thought I'd just show this, I mentioned this call yesterday, so we've done some research on where community land trusts are and in every region of the country apart from the east of England, 
community land trust, the blue dots on this chart, are in more deprived parts of the region than the regional average. So even in the uh, Yorkshire and Humber where Claude is, so the average is kind of around the middle there, there's a green dot and the blue dot on the left. Across Yorkshire and the Humber, community land trusts are in more deprived parts of Yorkshire and Humber than the average in that area. So they have tended to focus in places with deprivation and also places with big problems with affordable housing. That's, and I say concentrate now, I mean that's where people have started them, because no one else is no one's telling anyone to start a CLT, they're just started by people in their communities. The first community land trust is actually in America. Um, it, there's a really great video called The Ark of Justice, which is where I got the title for this presentation from, which you can sadly have to buy the DVD, I think. But it's a really interesting story about a community of black farmers in Georgia, in the South America, uh, southern states, who were constantly harassed by racist county and state officials and were struggling to keep their farms going. And they decided in the night, they, 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 through the civil rights movement and community organizing in, the, in 1969, they formed a new kind of a cooperative, which they called a community land trust to take ownership of all of their land uh, and farm it. And then they still had a long, they've had an interesting long story. So in the eighties, they eventually collapsed because they were having they had a series of droughts and they couldn't get loans and they successfully eventually sued the government for racial discrimination and not giving them finance and were able to re-establish themselves and buy back some of their land. So it's kind of an ongoing story in the US of racial injustice. But the community land trust bit of it was basically this idea they had that they didn't just want to own the, own the farmers as individual sort of farm owners and they didn't just want to own it between themselves as farmers as a cooperative traditionally but they wanted it to be something which everybody who lived in the community had a stake in to share the benefits of ownership and set to, to bring more justice to the community as a whole. So the idea of the community land trust is anyone who lived and worked in the area could join it, they all jointly owned it, and that community land trust had to use that land for the benefit of the whole local community. So how does it create jobs and prosperity and wealth for that local community? And since then, it's spread all across the United States, it's spread to Puerto Rico, to Belgium. Um, there's, there's a really interesting book all about the kind of global spread of the community land trust movement and in the UK as well. And in England, it looks quite different. So this is probably the most typical kind of community land trust, smallish rural housing developments in villages where the village controls the development and decides what kind of affordable housing they need. And it's great, it's kind of providing a lot of affordable housing that's genuinely suited to the local area and is controlled and owned by the people in that village. Or it's a bit more ambitious, it's new garden villages. Um, so big, this is a 500 home scheme in Cambridgeshire, big developments again controlled and owned by local people. Or it's taking over existing things. So this is a, a council estate in Westminster that was part of or was threatened with demolition back in the 80s by the Conservative Council that was trying to basically gerrymander the political boundaries and clear people out of some wards. So they wanted to kick all the council housing out of this particular bit of Westminster. And eventually a long campaign, the community took ownership of their estate and they now manage it as a CLT. And they've been building new homes here as well as a community centre, um, a youth centre and various other facilities. So really ambitious, you know, take control of and ownership of all of your housing and all of your facilities and then manage them yourselves. It's more recently kind of new citizens campaigns starting up in, in this case, this is in Mile End, very diverse area, campaigning to have similar level of control over the regeneration of a big site that was originally a workhouse, then was a mental health hospital, that was decommissioned, it's called St Clements, and London citizens and a community land trust forming to say, we want to take this site forward, we want to be in control of it and not just have it done unto us because we see regeneration happening in London as a process that is uh, prioritising the needs of the better off and also in a lot of parts of London leading to forms of racial discrimination because of the, the average incomes of people in the area, jet by and large, black and minority ethnic people unable to afford the homes and so being cleared out or having to leave the area for wealthier white residents. So, and they've succeeded in this and they've, they've, they've done this development, they've got others coming around London. And um, they're not just doing housing, so they own community shops, and this is one in Somerset where they also led the response to COVID by making sure they were delivering food parcels to people in the, in the, the local area. There's one in Cambridgeshire that is, um, it's 
that has built some housing and it's now retrofitting a district heating system to all the homes. So all the people who basically currently have oil heating, they're going to take them all off of oil and put them onto a renewable energy system. And they, there's one in um, Shropshire that is just buying farmland and is focused on conservation. So community land trusts are doing all sorts of different things around this idea of taking land into community ownership um, and then making it work for the community. Uh, but mostly, they're pretty white, a bit like my screen, as Claude says. Um, and there are examples like the one in Mile End where you've got a more diverse group of people involved, but those, the people who you would hear speaking about the project and leading it are mostly white. Um, and although they are overrepresented in deprived areas, again, often the people who lead those projects or that the people who kind of end up being the face of the sector are quite white and middle class. So there's a, there's a problem for us and a kind of an opportunity to say, well, this, this model came from the civil rights movement in the US, let's make it a stronger part of racial equity in the UK. And there's every reason why we should. So some examples, um, Community Land Scotland, our sister body for Scotland, they did some really interesting research recently on the links between slavery and land ownership. And one of the most amazing statistics was that around a third of the West Highlands and islands in Scotland were bought and you know those big estates they were bought by people with slavery profits and land the sort of pattern of land ownership in Scotland and across England is often drenched in slavery. That's why people own the land because they have made money from slavery. And um, we know now in relation to things like COVID that black and minority ethnic people are more likely to be homeless, overcrowded, fuel poor, have all these housing problems and they're all linked to the high rate death rates in COVID. So it's a key part of the kind of economic injustice that people face. And there have also been not just housing, but other things that do with ownership of land, homes, business premises. So in the former life, I worked at the Greater London Authority, and we looked at small businesses being cleared out in areas where places like Brixton, where people have created businesses, made the place a success. They've generated more commercial investment into the area, and then the landlords go, great, we'll stick up the rents. We'll regenerate this and make it more expensive because we can make, we can charge higher rents now that this is a really exciting place. And suddenly all those businesses in a place like Brixton, which of course would mostly be um, have been founded by black people, were being kicked out and forced out because they couldn't afford those rents because they were just running in a you know, say an M&T garage or a market store, all sorts of businesses that couldn't afford them. This is all because they don't own the land. And if you don't own the land, you can't build wealth in your community because the person who does own the land is going to take that wealth. So the Community Land Trust the idea is to achieve racial justice and other forms of justice through ownership of the land. The model is the community, anyone living or working in the local area can join and they have an equal vote. Land, you're taking that land out of the market and trust, you're not using it, you're holding it in trust for the community and using it for the long-term well-being of the community, whatever that involves. Um, why is this not more common and how do you make this happen? So these are the three key barriers. It's, how do you get access to land or building, the finance to make it happen, the expertise to help you figure out how to do it. And also a widespread culture of paternalism in the UK because the kind of power of community just isn't really recognized in local government, in business. Even in many of our communities, we basically look to someone else to sort things out for us. It's like, well, the council's got to fix that, or the government's got to fix that, or house builders will build the homes we need. And actually, tackling that culture of paternalism and seeing examples like Claude was describing with Frontline, the power of what people can do themselves. And then underlying all of this is structural racism, which makes all of that much harder if you're coming from a background where you are um, black or minority ethnic, and then especially also if that intersects with being low income and other kinds of issues. You know, it's harder to get access to the land and finance. Funders often, you know, there's well-documented problems with people getting access to funding if you're coming from um, a black and minority ethnic background and the cultural paternalism could be that much worse as well. But you can do it and you know, Claude's done it, there are projects that have done it and we're dedicated to making this more, more possible. And we could have a bit of discussion in the comments about this um, and I'll just give you some, some resources, but broadly speaking, your best chance of getting a land, land or a building is either a public body, like a council that has something that's vacant, that's not being used or that's being underused and you can make a pitch to them as to how you could use it better, or a sympathetic private owner. If you're just going to trade in the market for these assets, you need to be in a place that's either not very competitive, 
So you're not going to necessarily be bidding against people or you have a really strong business and you can make a commercial offer for that land or that building. Um, and that's obviously hard if you're just starting out. Finance, there are lots of sources of grant funding, loan options, banks, all the rest of it. And the basic thing it comes back to is, do you have a, a sustainable business plan? And if you don't, is someone going to give you a grant to fill the gap? So that's always the hard thing with things like community centres is, where's your income going to come from, from running that community centre to pay back the loan for having bought the property um, if you need that um, and the upkeep of it and so on. And the interesting thing with housing is that it's a pretty tried and tested business model. People pay their rents or they buy the house off you and you can kind of, there's, there's grant from government for funding affordable housing to, for, to you know, make up the difference. So there are sources of finance. I don't want to make it sound easy because <laughs> this stuff can often be a bit of a challenge, but um, there is quite a bit out there. And then expertise, what we've been doing is building up a network of organisations across the country, which we call enabler hubs, with access to trained advisors like Claude, who can give you, they, they can provide you the expertise, they'll help you to make it happen. Um, to cap, tackle the cultural paternalism, um, it comes back to good old community organising and building yourself up in the local community into an organisation that has lots of members, that can demonstrate it's got the skills and the capabilities to make things happen and that puts political pressure on those who are holding you back and whether that and so in the case of i gave an ex example of the former workhouse in mile end that was a many years of community organizing to eventually get that site off the mayor of london and into community hands and on structural racism you know just the the the, the thing then the, the inspiration we take from our friends in america is take back control take ownership if you don't own it you're not in control of it and that's what is ultimately powerful about this model. It's taking ownership, not just looking to run services and something that someone else owns. And if you want to do it, there's this network I mentioned of enabler hubs. There's Leeds Community Homes in the heart of England, where Claude is. Uh, sorry to everyone, Sheffield, calling back Leeds, the heart of England. Um, there's a website, Community Led Homes, where we've got stacks of information resources. You can find information on our website as well. And then there are similar organizations to ours that do other sorts of assets. So there's like, um, the um, Plunkett Foundation, which focuses on rural businesses and pubs and shops and things like that. And there's Locality, which has a, what, a network of community organisations running things like community centres. So there are lots of other organisations out there in the sector here that can help you. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, Claude's put his email address in that there you go. So you can always go to Claude and he will... Uh, <laughs> It's going to help everyone. Um, so this is a webinar format. So if you want to ask any questions or make any comments at this point, I think you can stick it in the chat box or the Q&A. Maybe the chat is easiest to keep it in one place. Um, love to hear from you, maybe more a bit from Greg, for example, about um, what you're looking to do, taking over community building. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, would add, I would add to what Tom has said that um, even if you don't have a question, I've got a couple of questions that we'll put in, in, in before the meeting that I'm going to come to. But all councils now have a legal obligation to, in principle, have a self-build register so that you can get in touch with your local council and, 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 and get on their website and get your name on their um, right to build website. Um, um, register so that they can know the interest and some of the things that have come out in, in when in, in when um, Tom's been speaking was when he spoke about Brixton and the gentrification of Brixton if we look across the UK every single black community whether it's Chapel Town whether it's um, um, Handsworth, whether it's Radford in Nottingham, whether it's Highfields in Leicester, whether you know, whether it's um, Ladbroke Grove in London, whether it's Lewisham, all of these areas are being, have been, and are being gentrified right now. And what what I liked about what Tom says is that um, if you don't own it, if you don't own the land, you don't have no power. You, you know, even if you own the house on the land, you still don't have the power. Um, I've got a couple of questions here, Tom. Um, it says, one says, 
um, I would like to know how to secure a community hall for a local community. For instance, I have seen other communities securing halls. They are empty buildings, but hard to know where and who to contact. That's one question. I'm interested in how to get property like a house as I would like to start a refuge. And the final one is I'm really interested in this model of development, but need to have, do I need to have networks where I live? And would I want to, would I want to move to another part of the UK to develop a project? Um, how realistic am I being? So there's three questions there. Do you want to take them or I can take them? Why don't you have a first shot and then I'll, I'll Sorry. follow up. Why don't you have a first shot of it and I'll follow up? <laughs> How did I know you was going to say that? Um, what I would say to the first question, how can you secure a community hall? What I would say is if you identify a building um, or what I would say is check out whether you've got one of, um, one of the hubs in your area. They can give you advice. Um, so if you can get, you know, uh, one of the local hubs, um, that would be for me the first part of call and then um, take some advice from them and then look at setting up your group and your committee. Um, you can have interest in how to get property like a house for, as I would like to start a refuge, Tom. Yeah, um, I suppose I think I think with particularly we're trying to do uh, something like a refuge or some a project like that. Then, as Claude said, your hub is a good place to start because it's figuring out. Well, that, that they could help you look at explore the general questions of where you might be able to acquire a property, help you with the business plan for it. And then I guess if you're doing something specialist like a refuge, and I'm not sure what sort of refuge it would be, is it a women's refuge or you know, so on, is then obviously there are specialist charities that's in those sectors that could also give you advice. And I guess wanting to talk to other people who've done similar things, because then you'd have particular needs, wouldn't you? You'd want to have, thinking about where that building is located, how secure it, appear, um, it, can, be, it can be, the kind of the suitability of the rooms and all the rest of it. Okay, um, okay we've got a Edward Gordon with a raised hand. I don't know how we get the raised hands people to come in. Is there somebody from Running Mead that can let Edward speak? I've just, I've just, uh, there's a thing that says allowed to talk. All so right, we've got a minutes to finish up. But Edward, have you got? Oh, I think you just said on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, much time. So I just wanted to say, um, yeah, all of what the two of you are saying. In Claude and Tom, um, really concur, especially because of my based in London, based in Brixton, in fact. Okay. And I'm, I'm familiar with a couple of um, CLTs around this area. Um, and the last, well, I think it was the last slide that uh, Tom showed. The, the finance and expertise, I can sort of see the way through on those. But it's the, um, it's the access to land and, as you said, the paternalism that's of the most concern. So absolutely, CLTs around this area, the CLTs definitely good way through. However, um, and the last urban areas, I mean, my ex Tom showed, the, the finance and the expertise, I can sort of see those. But it's the um, it's the access to paternalism that's of the most concern. So that definitely seem to be the solution because we're all gentrification. It really seems to be the the kind of good way through. However, particularly in, I'm just going to mute Edward. Sorry, because I think I think we got the gist, and then it started repeating the audio for some reason. There's some problem with the connection. But um, so Ed was saying that getting the expertise in the finance he could see, but he was wondering about the land and being in Brixton is a really illustrative example because there was a community land trust called Brixton Green CLT that was got, went through a long process with Lambeth Council and then was eventually excluded from the project by the council. Um, so there's no there's no easy answer where that cultural paternalism kicks in and that in that case that council decides it doesn't want, want the community to have any control. Um, 
and in very expensive places with scarce land like London, it is very hard for communities to get access to land. Um, but there are starting to be more examples of that happening around London, including from more councils that are starting to be a bit less paternalistic and to see the benefits of community power. And then, you know, the kind of effectiveness of your community organising and um, can obviously then can play a part in making a strong case for it. But ultimately, it remains the case that communities can be fairly powerless. Um, but we're hoping, you know, that, that this is growing. Um, and so maybe, hopefully, maybe we'll be able to re-engage with it at some point and bring one forward in Brixton. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. Running Need have said we've run out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've sent me, they've sent me a, a flap as well to say that we've got to leave. <laughs> we've got to be out of here for four o'clock, even though we started late. But um, I'd like to thank everybody that took the time to attend today. Thank you, Tom, for the invitation. Thank Running Mead for the invitation. And thank you all who have put questions in the chat and put questions on the um, what's over. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, thanks to Claude and thanks to everyone else for attending. Um, get in touch with us if you want to know more. Cheers. Thank you.